Welcome back to another episode of Contractor Secrets with Trade Business Accountants. My name is Bailey Peachy and I'm joined once again by Troy Larkham. And in this episode, we're going to carry on right where we left off with another Q&A. So it's been a uh, pretty busy week here at Trade Business Accountants HQ, but um, you know, a lot, plenty on, but uh, pretty excited to sit down and record this episode. We had some mic issues last time where the audio was not good. <laughs> So I apologize to everyone listening for that. We've got some new mics, which I'm very excited about because we cracked it and ordered some new ones, so that's good. So hopefully the audio is a bit better this time around. But yeah, very keen to get stuck in. Troy, you got any opening statements? Glad to be back. Round two, let's get stuck in. Fantastic. Question one, what are your thoughts on discounts? What are my thoughts on discounts? Discounts are stupid. <laughs> so honestly, they, they might seem like a really, you know, like a fire sale. They might seem like a really great way to just get a bunch of leads in, get some work, keep the crews busy. But what I'm finding myself saying all the time is that busy doesn't always mean profitable. So, you know, when you discount, even by just a little bit, your bottom line profit is the first thing to go. And again, that's your reward as a business owner. So a little example, if you have a 10% net profit margin, good, good profit margin, right? But when you discount a job, even by 5%, you've just robbed yourself of 50% of that bottom line profit. And to make up for that lost profit, you'd literally have to double your sales. So it's a, it's a, it's a bad game to play. Uh, and while you know 5% discount at the time might not seem like that, that big of a deal, right? It's only 5%, doesn't matter. Just get it across the line, get the job, keep the guys busy. Um, we'll make up for it on the next one. But if you have that sort of pattern continuing, you're going to be working a lot more for a lot less. So... 5% discount doesn't seem like much of the time, but it's a huge, huge pay cut. And again, you know, there's there's heaps of uh, other side effects to discounting that we talk about as well. One of them is, you know, cheap positioning. Do you want to be the cheap contractor or the premium provider? You know, you've got to pick a side and stay there. You're going to attract price-focused customers. Again, you're going to work a lot more for a lot less. And, you know, there, are there some businesses out there that can pull off discounts? Yeah, like if you've got the capital and you can afford to run certain things as a loss leader to get people in the door, but if, unless you know your numbers intimately, you have the capital there and you know what you're doing, I'd steer clear. So discounts, not good for business. The negatives, in my opinion, outweigh the potential positives. Troy, what do you think? Um, I think the big one there is the numbers, knowing the numbers, because you, you made a good point there. You know, some, some contractors out there, they use discounting positively, but that's purely because they understand their numbers. Because in most instances, when you actually look at your numbers and you understand your numbers, you don't want case, more particularly your pricing numbers, you recognize that, oh shit, you know, discounting isn't a good thing to do. It's not beneficial to, to the bottom line. And I think that's probably the most important point here is if you actually want to understand the impacting of discounting in your own business, you've got to break down your own numbers. Super, super important because like you said, 10% you know, net profit margin, that's what we're all in business for, getting that profit at the end of the day, getting that return in the business, that's what the key here is. So, you know, a 5% discount might, might not look like much in terms of the, the top line revenue, the sales revenue, but when you actually look at that from the perspective of what matters most, what's sitting on the bottom line of your profit and loss, that's where it is, right? That's where it erodes. And I think, yeah, in, if, if you really want to understand why you make that statement, discounts is stupid, look at the numbers. Yeah, it sounds extreme, but even, you know, it's not always just, you know, with Mrs. Jones on a $400, $2,000 job right? Say you're bidding a larger project and there's multiple you know, parties at play. It's knowing, you know, if, if you intimately understand the numbers first, you know where your limit is. So instead of just going, ah, it's 10%, it'll get us across the line, bugger it, we'll just do it. But if you don't know where your margin stands originally, you might've just eroded all of your profit. Yep. Whereas, you know, you get the, the savvy contractor, so to speak, where they understand where it's like, well, I could go 5% lower here and still make X amount of profit. But if I go 10%, which is what they're asking of me, there's no point, yeah. you know, you can, yeah, it, it sounds extreme, but you can go broke sitting on a beach. So yeah. don't, don't do it. Yeah. And I think we're using the word discount and that's because it's a simple buzzword that you can use. But like you're saying, you know, if you're in commercial projects or larger projects, it's less about discounting. It's more so about just squeezing that price down to try and sharpen the pencil. Yeah, sharpen the pencil so we get that project over the line. And again, the, the, a lot of the attitude around this is, oh, I've got to keep the guys busy. Got to keep the guys going, but at feed the, end the beast. Of the day, yeah, yeah. feed the beast. But at the end of the day, it's, you've got to reflect on it and probably have a deeper analysis of your business model, your market, the clients that you're working with. Because if you're, you know, here or there, it's okay and it's going to happen. That's the nature of the industry. But happening every single time, or yeah. using it as a as a campaign exactly. where it's like, oh, we need work now. Let's yeah. discount. 
there's nothing left over to fund. So you need work to fund your business. Yeah. When you discount, there's nothing left to fund the business. So yeah. it's just be very careful with that one. So again, we're saying discounts are stupid, stupid, which yeah. is you know a really extreme way to say it. Yeah. But that's kind of where we're coming from with that one. Yeah, exactly. And I think a secondary thing to that that I just wanted to bring up and I noted was you've got to be careful here with who you listen to about this stuff. So obviously, from our point of view, you know, we're in the accounting side of things. Look at the numbers. Mm -hmm. It'll make sense very clear why we're saying discounts are stupid. Now, a lot of the time, something that we see is marketers or especially uh, you know, Google Ads experts and stuff like that. And I'll go, no, you yes, need discounts. You need you know, no call out fees and stuff like that because to them, they're coming from a very narrow perspective and mindset of getting leads, leads, getting leads. Well, of course, well, let's just make your service free. Then you're gonna get infinite leads. You're gonna, you're gonna fill your books up forever, but that's not what it's all about, is it's the combination of, yes, you need leads, but let's make sure you're making money. Let's make sure you get you make those leads are profitable for your business so you're actually getting a return at the end of the day. Yeah, a big <laughs> way to stir the pot with marketers is go, how about I pay you on results <laughs> and then see what happens. People you know, often don't want to talk to you yeah. because you know I think the most important thing is ROI in anything in business. Yeah. So if you're just fixating on leads, to what end? Yeah. So you know, I had a conversation once with the guy I wanted to partner with us and he's a marketer and you know, asking different questions and it was a really weird, weird phone call. Yeah. And he, he was excited to be talking to me, but he, we were disagreeing on everything. So I would, but he didn't realize. And one of those things was call out fees too. And he goes, yeah, but well, you know, when I remove the, the word call out fee, I get way more clicks. I get way more clicks on my Google ads. So, okay, but do they convert to better customers that yeah. pay more money and, and, and you know, exactly. bring good business to the yeah. company? It's like, <laughs> like, that's what I'm worried about. I don't care about clicks. Like, I don't give a shit about clicks. So again, yeah, that's where we're coming from. No, if you want a discount, just look at the numbers first. And oftentimes in our experience, at least, when people do intimately understand what numbers they need to be hitting, they don't want a discount. They feel way more proud to stand there and go, I'm sorry, but if I was going to give you a discount, I feel like I'm ripping off all my other customers, you know, yeah, exactly. or walking away from a major project going, look, we just can't do it for this price. I'm so sorry. Yeah, yeah. And I think that a key thing here that is a great measure to stop yourself discounting or stop yourself squeezing your price you start setting some, some pre-tax profit targets. Because mm. once you do that and then work backwards and you understand what your, your overhead cost is, projected overhead cost, and then you start thinking about what your gross profit margin target is, it starts to be very clear that you understand exactly what margin you need to be achieving on average across all your projects mm. to make sure that you're actually achieving your income goals as well as you know, build that capital safety net. Um, make sure you've got that cash buffer there for you know to weather any storms, essentially. So. That's going to be really, really important. And as soon as you know those figures and you know those targets, what happens is you, you, you're in a situation where someone's trying to you know, push you down the price, start to price pressure you a bit more. You start to think, well, if I drop this price by 5%, well, I know exactly how much that is in a reduction in my gross profit target and therefore what my reduction is in my credit tax profit and my return at the end of the day. If I do that, what's the point? And it takes away from the fact that, hey, if you want to keep the guys busy, like that's a really emotional place to be in, mm -hmm. which is where I've seen people run into hot water. Yeah. You know, I've seen businesses that have been turning over 30 years, yeah. like running for 30 years go under because of one bad project to keep keep the team busy. Yeah. So if that's the situation you're in and you're, just, you're panicking, under, like what you're saying, understand the numbers, understand what you need to be hitting. And then, you know, if, saying no to one project frees up the opportunity to find the better one. Yeah. Because it's out there. there. It's never been such an abundance of work for any trade right now. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't think I don't think anybody right now should be discounting. Yeah, hundred percent. There's massive opportunity out there. So yeah, discounts are stupid. Discount. <laughs> discounts <laughs> are stupid. Just, just to finalise on that point as well is uh, obviously we focus more on the number side of things for the last five minutes or so. But the the, the point you made about what kind of customers do you want to attract, mm. I think that's a big one because yes money is important but at the same time it's enjoying the business you're in and enjoying the customers you're working for if you're consistently the cheap guy and you position yourself as the cheap guy who are you going to attract yeah whether it's builders property managers or residential customers it doesn't matter who it is exactly. the principle still stands you're going to keep attracting the cheap people who at the end of the day even though they're getting you for cheaper they're going to keep focusing on grinding you down because it's not free like, it's like we spoke about, <laughs> yeah exactly and but it's like what we spoke about last week with the spectrum of customers mm. is on the really bad end, you have customers in their perception of value weighting price at 99%. So if you think about that, once you win 
a job from someone who's got that mindset, what do you think they're going to do throughout the entire job? Mm. How do I grind him down even further? Because he will. Yeah. He will buckle. He, if I apply enough pressure, yeah. this dude will buckle. Exactly. Whereas you put that on the flip side with the good customers that, you know, price might only be weighted at 60 or 70%. There's that room of value and they're not going to be trying to squeeze you because they understand, well, if I squeeze in here, yeah, I might get some win in you know, reducing the price and not having to spend as much, but immediately I know I'm eroding the value I'm going to get from him in the long run because well, he's not making the money he's making from it. Why would he want to give me a good service at the end of the day? Well, that's the thing. They're fixating on the service, not the price. So again, the, the, we should have said this too. This is a really good point. The way that you price your services says a lot about the type of people you're going to attract to your business. Yeah. That's the summary here. Yeah. So, you know, next time you want to discount, you know, if, if you, hey, if you want to be the busy uh, and broke contractor, go ahead, discount, be the cheap guy. There's nothing wrong with being the cheap guy if you want to be busy and broke. Yeah. But if yeah. you want to make money and you want to be able to work with high quality customers and, you know, be able to run a thriving business that supports more people than just yourself and you can, you know, make more money to give back and have more impact in your personal life and in your community, whatever it is, whatever the goal is for business, discounting probably is not the way to do it. And I think in, in alignment with that is a, a, a good way to visualize this is if you think about positioning yourself as the cheap guy, the guy who's always coming in and low-balling prices, naturally, this is going to be your loop. You, you price cheap, you deliver the work, to make money, you've got a shortcut. You've got to not deliver a good experience, not deliver a good service for the customer. Naturally, the customer's not going to be as happy. They're, you're not going to get referrals. Sure, you're the cheap guy, but people at the end of the day still want value. Comes around to the, to the end, well, now to win more work, because you don't have those referrals, because you don't have that reputation positioning in the market, well, I'll keep my, try, my prices cheap. And you just end up in that negative feedback loop where you can never really build a successful business from. Compare that to the person who prices what they need to price, make them the, the margin that they need to make. Well, great, now I don't need a shortcut. Now I can focus on great service, focus on great experience for the customer. What do you think that customer's going to do? They're going to love you. They're going to be a raving fan. They're going to want to keep keep you around whenever they need more electrical work, more plumbing work, whatever it is. And who do you think they're going to tell grandma about? Who are they going to tell their work colleague? It's going to be you because they trust you. They know you can deliver. So great. Now you've got this reputation. People want to come work for you. Oh, this raises our prices even more because now the market is valuing our services. That's a positive feedback loop that you can build a successful business from. And they're the two really ways you can visualize it. And you know, again, like you were saying, the choice is up to you. I know which way I'm going. Yeah. To, to wrap up here, price is only an issue in the absence of value. Everyone listening right now, no matter what trade or industry you're in, you have worked your ass off to get where you are today, to build your craft, to be able to deliver excellence. Don't discredit that. So again, that's our take on discounting. Um, some people think it's an extreme way. They go, well, how could you possibly? I actually had someone tell me, how could you say discounts are stupid? That's ridiculous. I said, oh, okay. <laughs> I don't know. How, how could I? So anyway, that's question number one. That's, that's our thoughts. Uh, question number two. In the last year, I've been struggling to grow my team. I have the work. I just can't get the manpower. I've put up posts on social media and advertised on Seek, but there hasn't been much interest. What else should I try? Troy, did you want to lead with this one, my friend? This is a big one, and especially right now, you know, in the, <laughs> the current state of the, the, the market right now, we've got record you know, unemployment. We've got circumstances where it's just becoming increasingly hard to find and hire, let alone retain, the right people. So when it comes to, to the hiring side of things, I think the, 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 the best way to look at it is, and probably the biggest mistake I see people make, is the typical hiring approach in the construction world or the trading construction world is, hey, you know, I bring in all this work, I'm getting busy as hell, shit, I need someone. Reactive. Reactive. And they go, right, let's put an ad up on Seek, you know, oh, old mate who called me the other day, I'll just call him back, see if he wants to come on site on Monday. Um, that's, that's really the typical approach. And what you're doing there is opening yourself up to, you know, that one to two week window to try and find the best of a bad bunch. And naturally, that's not going to end up really well. What you really want to be doing here is having a, a more proactive approach to recruitment. Where it's a planned event. It's planned. And what I mean by that too is not just opening yourself up to a two-week window, but 52 weeks in the year. Because what you're doing is you're making recruitment and hiring a priority in your business. So like you're saying, you're building a plan around that. You're always executing on it week by week putting more content out there, more posts, more you know, recruiting ads, whatever it is, you're constantly showing up and telling the market, hey, we're looking for someone. So I, I think 
from a, a foundational perspective, that's really, really important to solidify here. Well, would you even say, because I, I hear you say this all the time, that like hiring is marketing. Yeah. Just as you advertise to attract great clients, you need to advertise to attract top talent. Yeah. Because why would you know why would a superstar want to come work for you exactly. if if you're not yeah. showcasing any other reason that you're just a normal con- like if there's nothing different about you same as you're trying to win a job why would anyone want to come work with you? One hundred percent, and I think that, that's a great analogy because it's no different to you know if, if we look at it from a marketing perspective in your business, what are you doing? You're trying to make your business look as great as po- as possible for prospective clients to want to choose you. No different to hiring. You want the best marketing out there in terms of, from a recruitment perspective, to be attracting the best people. And why you want the best people? Because in business, the biggest leverage point you have are people. Mm. So so critical. Yeah, you can implement systems, software, whatever, all the all those other components, which are important, of course. But people, people run the systems. But people run the systems. And what you do as the business owner is you don't t- typically build the business. You build people, and people build your business. Mm. I'm not sure who said that, but I thought I thought it was just such a great way. To, to, to break that down in simple terms. And, I, and with that is, that's why you want good people because the, the amount you can amplify your efforts in the business is limited by the kinds of people you have. And not to mention, the only thing, you know, people are the only thing that come to work with an attitude. So if you've got people that are coming in with the wrong attitude, you know, they don't want to be there, they're not there to, you know, for the greater vision of the business and what you're ultimately trying to achieve, of course you're going to run into stumble, you know. That you got to stumble with them. So that's why it's important that you focus on, like you're saying, marketing is hiring. You've got to be positioning yourself as, shit, I want to go work for those guys. Mm. They look like the go-to guys. And a, a great analogy for this is, look at motorsport. You know, where do the best drivers, the best mechanics, the best engineers, what, what team do they want to go drive for? The ones sitting right at the top of pit lane. Why is that? They're in the championships, for wins, the culture, Success. People want that. And you know who are in motorsport? A players. Mm. That's who we need to be trying to attract. So if you're you know positioning yourself through your, your, let's say, let's go to the extreme. You have no market. You have nothing out there that says we are we are the best of the best. You think you're gonna attract the best? Like a seek ad is not gonna get you very exactly. far. Exactly. Because so, all they're gonna look at is like, okay, what's the hourly rate? Where are they located? Oh, okay, you know. Exactly. You, you you filter in with with the mediocre of the rest. And nothing stands out, so what are you going to attract? Mediocre. That's that's all you're going to get. Whereas if you go from the other perspective and you go, you position yourself as the winners, the ones with all the opportunity, the, the ones that have opportunity for them to grow in a career, the ones that have you know the best projects on. You know, they look, you know, ten out of ten, they've got great uniforms, they're rolling around in the best vans, the best utes, the best trucks, the best machinery, whatever you want to call it. They're, that's where the best people want to go. Because it looks like the best operation. It looks like they've got the best opportunity there to, to not only you know enjoy the business for themselves, but the culture in there as well of who else is working there. Because that's another side note. A reason why A players want to work in operations that that look the best is because A players typically work at operations that are the best. And who do A players want to work with? Other A players. A players hate working with C players because they have to pick up their slack. Mm. And that's really, really draining for them. They don't like that at all. So obviously we've gone on a huge whirlwind here, but I think it's, it's really important is this isn't necessarily a, a quick fix solution, and especially in today's environment, but you need to be doing everything you possibly can to communicate that you guys are the best in the business. Yeah, and that ties into as well, like I, obviously I haven't seen the social media post. I haven't seen the Seek ad, yeah. but um, consider changing the offer. You know, if the offer is pretty basic, you know, make it more enticing. You want to, like, like Troy's saying, you want to be the employer of choice. And a good example of this, a little shout out to one of our clients, YTB Plumbing. Yeah. Director Peter Bond is just, <laughs> he's he's awesome. He's yeah. such a powerhouse. If you want to know how to position yourself as, as an attractive business to come work for, look at that. Look at YTB Plumbing. Some of their videos, especially, because uh, they start off with, they got the origin story video, they got the um, day in the life video. They're just coming out now with like an our process one, which is just going to, it's going to be one of them. It's going to be yeah. f- fucking good <laughs> it's gonna be really really good and what he does uh really well is builds a high performance culture where like all the time he gets people messaging him all the time wanting to come work for him and a little important note here with top talent you either grow and develop it or you steal them mm, yeah yeah you know, if you want the best people like because again if, if you've got a real a high achiever will sacrifice money to be in a better working environment yeah. to be happier 
and feel more supported. So again, position yourself as the best. Yeah. It's no different to trying to win work. Yeah, and, and I love that point you, you made there. You can either grow them or you can steal them. Now, when we say grow, that, you know, growing apprentices. And that, that's a vibe of things. Or, take, or taking someone with the right attitude and yeah. developing them and giving them the, the necessary time, training, and, and room to grow. Yeah. And, and that's an important thing to do in business. The only problem with it is it's a longer game plan. Yes, you should be doing it, but it's a longer game plan. Mm -hmm. Whereas to be able to, to steal guys, and what, when we say steal, we're not saying you walk around the site and go offering people an extra two bucks an hour. What we're saying is, like we've been talking about, positioning yourself as the best. Attracts the like negative. Exactly, because if they're you know working right now and they're going, man, I'm just really dreading going to work right now. Yeah, I'm loyal to my boss. But I'm working my ass I'm off. I'm dealing off. with idiots. Yeah. I'm stuck with no gear, so it's making my life harder. Yeah. There's nothing fun about this anymore. I'm doing the same repetitive stuff that doesn't, you know, it bores me. I've got no opportunity. I can't see myself being able to grow any further than what I'm doing now. Exactly. Like this, this isn't what I signed up for. And then he's driving to work and then he's looking around and he keeps seeing those great looking vans. Well, no, what he sees is YTB's big red fire truck <laughs> smashing down the Gold Coast Highway yeah. with big smiles on every crew member in the fire truck. Yeah. You know, it's like, come on, what are you Exactly, doing? And, and that's what you need to be creating is that environment where you're just attracting the best people. You're the employer of choice. And a great analogy is, you know, if you looked into a completely di different sector, tech, where do the smartest tech people go? Apple, of course. Well, <laughs> and that, yeah, exactly. Apple, Google, the, the top guys, they're not going for the shit. There's a reason why those companies attract the best talent in the world because they've got the best culture, the best opportunity. They're winners. They're champions of industry. That's what you need to try and position yourself as. Of course, you know, I'm not saying try and become Apple, but the point I'm trying to make is you need to try and position yourself as the best the brightest, the, 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 you know, the most exciting opportunity out there in the market that's going to make some, because again, A players are loyal to their current courses. It's a big call for them to go, hey, I'm going to stop working here and jump ship to another business. There's got to be a damn good reason for that. So like you were saying before, it's got to be a great offer. It's got to be great positioning that is going to be enticing enough for someone to, to, to make that leap of faith. Yeah. So again, just assess what you're currently doing and maybe there's some room to improve one, the offer or two, just the marketing efforts in general. Because yeah. again, if you want to attract a certain type of person to your business, you've got to get real with what work you're putting in to do that. Exactly. Exactly. So yeah. And, and I think a, a big one there is going right back to the start with everything we spoke about is just that proactive and reactive recruitment. Do not just put one out, ad out there, open it for two days and then uh, in two weeks, sorry, and shut the application process. You are going to end up with the worst bunch you could possibly have. Recruitment all the time, focusing on it, putting it out there. You guys are always looking for the best, as well as marrying that against with you know positioning yourself as the best at all times. Yeah, so nothing on a tangent here, but people will make or break your business, as we were sort of alluding to. Yeah. And you know, one ugh, the costs and the time and the energy and the heartache and the just the long term problems that come with a wrong hire. Even if you've only got them for a month or yeah. two weeks, it's like, it it's not worth it. So again, proactive, not reactive. Yeah. Uh, question three. How much profit should my business be making if I'm turning over 1.5 million? And what should I do with it? What should I do with what I make? I'm currently making about 7% after I paid all my staff and overheads. Okay, so this is a great, great question. And what I love about this question particularly is that this guy's focusing on profit, not top line sales revenue. Yeah. So after everything else has happened, he's making 7%, which is fantastic, right? That's what he's focusing on. And why I like that because I see a lot of trade business owners, they get really caught up and almost obsessive with uh, with the uh, the vanity metric of revenue, right? Yeah. So it sounds, you know, it sounds great to be able to puff up your chest, walk around, tell all your friends and family like, hey, I run a $10 million company. Yeah. But if you're not actually making any money, yeah. right? If there's nothing that's coming out of that, what's the point of all that work and all that risk? Yeah. That's the way that I kind of look at it. So focusing on profit is absolutely the right attitude to have in business. And to push that, you know, what we help our clients do is have a bottom up approach to their finances rather than a top down approach. Um, so in particular, when this comes to profit. So I see um, a massive amount of trade business owners. They work really, really hard all year round. They don't really have any clarity or structure um, with financial targets, so to speak. So they work really hard and they just hope that there's some money at the end of the day. They go, you know, I'm going to put my ass off, uh, work my ass off, I'm going to be busy. I'm going to hope that there's going to be some money for me at the end of the day after I paid all my bills, paid all my staff, all my supplies. Uh, but the problem here is that without clarity around the numbers, 
you could have major problems in how you're operating where more work doesn't actually mean more profit. I mean, we see that all the time. I'd say even, you know, well, like 65 to 70% of companies that come to us are in a position where volume is detrimental to their cash because there's no clarity around those numbers and what they need to be pricing um, the jobs at and stuff like that. So knowing the math in your business is really important here. Um, and you can, w- without knowing the math, you can really easily think that being busy and taking on as much work as possible is the only way to earn more money, which just often isn't the case, like I'm saying. So that's the top down approach. What you know, Focus on sales and then hope at the end of the day that there's profit left over at the bottom. What we do and it's instead, right, then this is what this guy's sort of focusing on here, which I really like is, you start at the bottom. How much do I need to earn, right? How much do I need to earn this year? And then you model everything backward from that. So then you go up, right? So you figure out exactly what margins you need to be hitting and then how much work is actually then required based off set margins. So, and once you've got that established, you can then track it every month and track it you're going. Now, we have a wicked tool that we run every client through to do this um, and establish all this stuff. But, um, you know, this guy should definitely be speaking with his accountant because this is something that they should, should be helping him with. I would hope they would be helping this, helping him with this. Uh, but to answer this question in terms of, you know, how much profit should he be making off of, you know, a $1.5 million turnover? So he's currently at 7%. As a general rule, what we tell everybody is, hey, 5% or less in operating profit, pre-tax profit, means your business is likely on life support. It's just not enough. It's, it's too slim of a margin. Now, 10% means you have an okay business. 15% in operating profit, pre-tax margin means, pre-tax profit means you have a good business. And then 20% or higher is what we would consider to be a great business. Um, so again, right now, this guy's sitting close to having, you know, an okay business based off bottom line profit. But how much he should be earning you know, I think he should be striving towards the 15%. If he set the goal for 15%, like this guy, just the way that he's asked this question, he's onto it. I think if he set the target for 15%, he would make it happen. Yeah. That's my two cents. You know, like we, we help or we strive to help every single client hit that 20% mark or higher. But, you know, as a starting point, I think he should be going for at least 15%. Exactly. And I think going back to what you're saying before, is from a numbers perspective, I would much rather, in his case, drop revenue by $500,000 to increase his margin to that 15% mm. versus trying to go up to the $2 million in revenue and have to probably sacrifice a bit of that profit because then that is going to make more money going down and increasing his profit margin. But I think the, the, it's, a, it's a great question um, and I think there's a, a really important lesson there and you use the word is need. Mm. And I think that's a big one because when it comes to profit, a lot of people talk about, oh, how much profit do I want to make? It's not the right question because at the end of the day, you actually need pre-tax profit because pre-tax profit is absolutely critical if you, if, especially if you want to grow because you need you need that that uh, extra cash there to, to actually fund growth, um, as well as building a capital safety net, as well as making a return. Yeah, just that. just elaborate on that. What, what is, is a capital, capital safety net? Everyone, is it? Yeah. So in your business, well, one thing that we see a lot is most businesses typically do not have a a cash buffer. Mm -hmm. Uh, In in business, there's going to be storms. You need to be out weather those storms. Because when you're growing, you need cash to to fund that growth because there's natural increases in cost. But unless you're getting that that extra cash being created from your your pre-tax profit and the the return that you're getting from your business, then you don't have any internal funding to actually make that growth happen. And that's where we see a lot of contractors actually having to look outside. Go into debt. Go into debt because it's the only way to see to, to, to make that growth happen. But they don't understand why because they're looking at their profit and loss and they're profitable, but they've got no cash. In fact, they're losing cash most of the time and they're having to look outside the business. And that's something that we see all the time. That's what you're talking about before where volume can be detrimental to growth. If you're growing too quick, mm. you need to grow at a steady rate. It's not just a, a, a buzz line to say, oh, yeah, make sure you don't grow too quick. But over trading kills more businesses than, than under trading. Yeah, especially if you're turning more than $1 million, that is going to be a huge killer. Mm. Huge killer. So I think so as well. Sorry, but you know, I'd like to see increases in profit over increases in debt. Yeah, big time, big time. And I think this. So this is where it comes back to what I was saying: is profit isn't a want; it's a need. You need it in your business. And like what you were saying before, a really important reason for this and why we've got those targets of you know less than five percent your life support, ten percent you're an okay business. The reason why we say ten percent is an okay business is because, you know, from our experience in an actual study by Zero, which is, you know, obviously one of Australia's leading cloud-based accounting software. Yeah, one of the worlds, there you go. Um, is 
they did a study that every on on average every single year five to fifteen percent of revenue goes uncollected. So if you think about that from a profit and loss perspective, while you you could be making ten percent in pre tax profit or net profit, if you actually looked at that from a cash flow perspective, and again cash is king, you, you can't pay bills and wages with profit. Only cash is how you can do that. Cash is what funds the business. So if you're only at a 10% pre-tax profit margin, but you're not collecting 10% of your cash, well, then you're only breaking it from a cash flow perspective. So that's just something we see all the time. And obviously that's only from an accounts receivable perspective of collecting money, but there's a lot of other areas like we are talking about before. If you're trying to fund growth, there's natural increases in receivables. There's natural increases in works and progress and, and inventory. So that's really, really important that, that you're managing that and that you're actually making profit because it's necessary. So that's largely where that 10%, you know, you, you, again, you're largely going to be aiming for more than 10%. Now, the, the other side of the argument is, oh, why don't I just get more of a handle on my receivables? <laughs> Go for it, sure. If you can bring those receivables right down and you're collecting everything, that's the target, that's the ideal. Because then if you're only making, you know, 10%, which we're calling here, you know, an okay business, well, in that case, you're actually doing pretty good. 10% pre-tax if you're collecting all your cash, it's fantastic. But the point of why we're saying, yeah, it's relative, but the point of why we're saying, hey, you want to be hitting 10% at a minimum is because if that's what you're striving for, you're likely going to hit that because anything below that is risky business. Exactly. exactly. But yeah, so I, I guess with, with those targets, they're good targets, keep them in mind. But again, it's, it's relative to uh, you know, the, your business and, and how you're operating. But typically what we see is you know, there's a lot of businesses out there probably only achieving you know, 5 to 7% pre-tax. It's generally not enough. You got to push higher. Yeah, and that kind of ties into as well. Um, you know, I, I see a lot of educators out there, whether it's accountants or business coaches or whoever. Is, you know, they're, they're always talking about cash flow management, like how to increase your cash flow. However, what I see them always talking about is cash flow forecasting and the timing and the uh, the timing of incoming and outgoing cash, which is absolutely important. You know, don't get me wrong; that that is very critically important. But the bigger issue here that we're seeing is exactly what you've just said: not enough cash to begin with. Mm. Forecasting is important, but the big issue is just having more cash. I see a lot of trade business owners just don't have enough cash in their business. Yeah. And, you know, I've spoken to a lot of people where they're just so used to having $0 sitting in their bank account. Exactly. Not all the time. Like, they're, you know, some guy, yeah. one of the last conversations I had, the bloke was waiting for 150 grand to hit his bank account. But the fact that there was nothing sitting there was the issue, at least in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, like, it's, not, it's just not a good spot to be in and it's not a good way to run a business. So, exactly. you know, our advice to, I know this was a profit question, but in terms of cash flow, my advice on cash flow management is, you know, start by having more cash. So prioritize, make an effort to build that cash reserve. Again, three to four months is a great goal, a really, really good goal to say, hey, I've got this cash here so that I could fund our entire operations, pay all our guys, even if we didn't sell anything. Yeah. We could keep the doors open yeah. uh, because that cash cushion, like we're saying, it's going to take away a lot of risk. It's going to take a lot of pressure off you as a business owner because like you're saying, storms come. Yeah. Something will happen. Someone won't pay, you know, whatever it is. <laughs> Something's going to happen. So have the, the cash cushion there. And again, once you've built it up, it's not profit to rip out the business. Mm. Don't touch it. Mm. Leave it there. That's the point. And I, I guess just on that too is one of the questions he asks is, what do I do with the profit? And that's a really important question because there actually, there is an order. And typically what we see is a lot of business owners do it in the wrong way. The, the, the typical approach is, oh, great, we've made a profit, let's pull it out, let's spend it. But I, I guess with that is, it's important that when you start making profit, there is an order here. The first component is making sure you're budgeting for how much you're actually going to have to pay in tax. Because you've got to pay tax on profit, mm -hmm. that, that's all part of it. The second thing is debt. So once you've, you've, you've budgeted for the tax component, then there's debt. Now, in debt, debt's always going to be in business. You know, uh, it's, it's all there's part of it. There's good and bad. There's good and bad, largely. But in terms of paying off debt, the debt I'm talking about is if you've got, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars outstanding in credit card debt and stuff like that, that that's not good debt. That you've been using to float the business it, because of a lack of cash. Exactly. So it goes back to our original point. So you've got to repay that debt. debt. Third is to build the capital safety net that we are talking about. So once you've budgeted for the tax, because yeah, you've, you've got to pay the tax. Yeah, but cap, you know, cap, capital safety net Cash cushion. Just cash think of it like, yeah. just hey, cash, cash reserve. reserve. Yeah, that's yeah. You know, it's, it's the cash cushion. So you've budgeted for your tax, you've paid your debts, your bad debts, you've now you know budgeted so you can actually build a, a, a cash, buffer in this, cash buffer in this regard. What you're left with then is what you can pull out as dividends. 
That's what you can take as a return. But the, the key thing here is when we use the word return, a lot of people think of return purely as you know what you're, you're pulling out. Return is the the the, uh, the net profit because at the end of sorry the pre-tax profit because at the end of the day, what you get with that return is how you can leverage to pay off debt. It's what you can use to build that cash buffer. It's what you can use to fund growth. That's the key. And you know if you are reinvesting with your profits to to build that business, and again, it's important you're paying yourself a fair market wage here, so you're actually making income. But if you just keep those profits in the business and keep reinvesting and building that. The, the cash buffer as such, over time, you're gonna get a way stronger return on investment. Because again, this is an important lesson is, your business is an asset. Now, if you're just pulling money out all the time, there's no cash sitting in there and you're not making much profit. There's no value to the there's asset. There's no value, there's no value to the asset. You're getting no return on investment. If you look at it like any asset, you're looking for a return. So in your business, the goal should be to be creating a return. Now, what you do with that return, like we've been talking about, if you reinvest it back into the business, all you're doing is building the asset to give you greater returns, that, which one day you might be happy with you know, not having any more growth, you've reached a nice level. Well, now you've got, you know, you, okay, you're budgeting for your cash. Hopefully you're at a point now where you don't have, you know, bad debt there because you've built a healthy business. Your, your cash buffer, well, it's sweet. You're not growing the business anymore. And you're ripping $1.5 million out of the business. Exactly. And then again, you know, what should I do? You know, speak to a financial planner, but you know, there's real estate, there's index funds, there's a whole different range of things you can do. Yeah. But, you know, use the money, park it in other appreciating assets. Exactly. But prioritize the business because that is the that's the fundamental source yeah. of the money. A lot of people rip the money out too prematurely, like we're saying. Yeah. Prioritize the business first, then you can park the money in other assets. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, I'm free after, but I think, yep. Yeah, remember tax, debt, build the cash buffer, dividends. Yeah, fantastic. Question number four. We work with builders in the commercial space and it's one giant race to the bottom when it comes to pricing. We're pumping out quote after quote to keep the crews busy. Do you have any ideas on how to better this process? Now, this is a really, really interesting question. A lot of people say this, right? I hear a lot of people say it's just a race to the bottom and there's this idea that you have to be a bidding machine just sitting there and you're just smashing that quote after quote after quote after quote. But this couldn't be further from the truth, right? So it doesn't matter that you're in the commercial sector, you're dealing with people. That's a really important point, you're dealing with people. So this whole business to business, business to government, business to consumer, doesn't matter, you know? doesn't matter. It's people to people. It's about relationships and you're dealing with people. So even in the commercial sector, you know, there's elements of jobs where there's uncertainty, there's cost blowouts, you know, and each company that you're dealing with has their own set of strengths and weaknesses. So, you know, what you need to do is know where their weaknesses are and know how to fulfill them. That's really important to understand because a lot of people just put in a price. It's just about banging it out, banging it out, and then not understanding how to communicate value in the process. Now, we, we always saying this value in the process, but it's critical. So to do this, you've got to understand the decision maker that you're dealing with, right? Again, it doesn't matter that you're dealing with builders in the commercial space. It's all the same. So you've got to understand the decision maker and you've got to understand what their drivers and their concerns are, and especially be able to communicate that you understand their situation and their process. That's a really, really important point to make. So if you can better understand and articulate their process back to them, then they're gonna say, hey, this guy gets it, right? That's the first point of feedback that you're gonna get. And then, you know, make sure that you can deliver on the things that's gonna hurt them the most because you're gonna take away their risk in doing that. So the whole thing about just being a bidding machine, banging out quotes, it's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. And, and it's narrow-minded thinking. You know, if, you know, if you're narrowed into thinking that, hey, here's a bill of quantities, Here's a job and just apply some numbers to, numbers to it. You know, it's price driven. We, we talk about this all the time, price versus volume driven contractors. Um, and you might be listening right now. Well, anyone might be listening right now. You're going, Bailey, you're an accountant. You know, <laughs> you sit behind a desk. You don't know anything, right? It's builded. All builders are the same. That's all they care about. The cheapest price. But no, I'm telling you, it's not how it works. And I'll give you some examples, right? So my dad... He did a job once for U-Foods. You know, it, you know, the client was a massive developer um, that had a, a cost impediment to the job, which was power, right? And that being said, his price uh, to bring power to the site, you know, the developer came back and said, hey, it's unworkable. We're going to lose the deal, right? Now, my dad knew that they had two other sites and proposed an alternative solution that they couldn't think of themselves, right? So instead of only bringing one feeder, putting all the conduits in, they said, hey, what if we instead feed three blocks and then split the cost across the three sites, right? Instead of just doing the one. 
And then, you know, not having to go through the government, they could just then go through him. So he put a cost plan together that got the developer to get the deal across the line for you foods, right? So he made the deal work. Now, this is important because it was all about understanding the landscape and the issues at hand. So instead of just responding with, you know, shit, the deal's gonna, not going to go through. I better drop the hell out of my price and give them the cheapest price possible to win the job. He pitched a value-driven solution that benefited all parties. And here's the important thing. It solved a big problem. Not getting that job was a big problem. And that was his positioning. And so, you know, there's frequently asked questions that everybody asks, that everybody wants them, you know, everyone wants answered. But it's like, well, you know, what should they be asking? You know, it's planting the seeds of doubt. You know, you need to understand their motives and drivers, right? In the tendering process. So one of our clients, they work with builders and many are pretty skinny on project management. It's one of those, one of those deals where it's like, hey, rock up the site, fend for yourself, kind of work in and just, just try and make it happen. That's, that's the kind of deal we're dealing with here. Um, so what they do is they spend the time to do you know, a proper debrief, monitor the landscape um, to see where they're at on their own project, right? And what they do is they provide a weekly report where they go, hey, it's very basic format, but they go, hey, here's where we're at. Here's what we're up to. Here's what we're doing next. You know, here's what's going on pretty much. And they're giving these builders more feedback on their own project than they're getting from their internal team, right? Like that's, that's value. It's very different to just banging out a quote. So, you know, ask yourself, how do you stand out from everybody else? It's, it's no different to when we answer any question about marketing. It's all the same. Estimation sales, it all, it all, it's all the same. You have to look out for the builder's best interest. And this is where people go wrong. They're selfish in the tendering process. It's not about you. It's about the builder, right? So if you just pigeonhole yourself and all you say is, hey, I look after this, whether it's electrical, plumbing, fire, you know, carpentry, whatever your trade is, Right, if you're just sitting there going, or if you're just going into this job selfishly trying to only look after your component of works, right? You're not considering how it's all gonna piece together. Like you look at any building, it's well, it's missed opportunity. Because you look at any building, you know, it's the build is an is a it's a system, it's one system. And in that system, there are natural constraints, right? Whether that's in delivery, whether it's in programming or scheduling. So, you know, if there's a a, a programming conflict between you and another service. And you let them know, you say, hey, this could be a barrier. You know, this could be an issue. You know, how do we, how about we do it this way? And you offer the alternative solution, which helped you anyway, because, you know, you're able to actually get in and do your work more effectively. You know, you're looking out for things that they've either overlooked or they can't foresee. You know, they've missed it because they're busy. So it's about being proactive and not being selfish and looking out for the, the entire build, not just your component of work. So, you know, in that instance as well, Oftentimes, as a business owner, you're probably going to be a lot more experienced in your specific line of work than the project manager that you're dealing with, right? So these guys, and you know, you know, they're busy and they don't want to look bad. No one wants to look bad. They're trying to do a great job. They're trying to work up the chain of command and they're, they're in operation. So if you can go in and offer any kind of assistance to these project managers, for example, where you're helping them, like purely just being their strategic advisor and helping them achieve their goals, you know, that's how you build a relationship and that's how you win the next job, All right? So again, to bring it back to the original issue, if you're just sitting behind a computer and you're banging out quotes, you know, and you don't have a, rela- a, a, a good relationship with the key decision maker, you know, that's step one. Go out, meet this person, get to know them and actually understand how you can help them win. Really different to how can I help me win, right? Because if you can make their life easier and you can make them look good in the process, they're gonna to wanna to keep you around over the, any other contractor that isn't doing that. Um, so key point here, you know, you've got to care about the outcome. You've got to go the extra mile and you've got to look out for them, not just yourself. Go the extra mile, place yourself in their shoes. You know, what are their drivers? What do they need? Um, it just makes for a better all-around experience. Again, you know, like dad's done jobs where there were major, major milestone issues where they were facing like 20 to 30 grand um, worth of liquidated damages a day. So they're losing money on the job, but he was still in there helping them to get the best outcome. You know, he treated it uh, more so as if it was his company's problem, not just his client's problem. Um, and that's why he would win so much work, right? Help them win. That's the number one aim. That is the number one aim over delivering your work. Help your clients win. Understand what are their particular circumstances, right? Um, that They might, well, oftentimes, like I'm saying, they don't have the certain exp- uh, expertise or experience in your component of works. They don't know what they should be looking out for. That's what I'm saying, frequently asked questions. Tell them what they should be asking. Re-educate them on what's going on. 
Um, and even, you know, sometimes a good example of this as well, you might be able to help someone by putting them in contact with someone else. It might not even be having anything to do with your component of work, but you go, hey, you need to call Mick. You know, he's going to be able to help to solve the, you know, he's going to be able to help you solve this problem and progress their job because that's what they're concerned about. So in the commercial space too, why it's so important to, if you're just banging out quotes and you don't have a real relationship, what happens when that person moves? You know, these guys and girls, they, they, they move around, they go to different companies and what they do though, is they take their contacts with them. So if they've had a great experience with you, suddenly you're not just getting work with the, the company that you've already established trust with. On the next company that they move to, they go, hey, we've used these guys before. They're really fantastic. Let me give them a call. Let them put a, a bid in. Like, uh, trust me, these guys are the go-to team. This is who you want to use. So get to know and understand the project managers. Get to know the contract administrators. Any decision maker that is involved, get to know them. Understand them. Give them respect. Show them that you know what, like, show them that you know what you're talking about and help them win. Help them win. And you can't do that if you don't understand the landscape. So again, you need to understand all of the stress and the risk points from the builder's perspective, not just your component of works. I sound like a broken record here, but it's not, it's not about you. It's about your, it's about your builder. That's the number one priority. So, you know, you have to be worried about things from their perspective so you can mitigate their risk, make yourself a no brainer. And as if you were an extension of their own team, not just a contractor or a subcontractor, I should say, right? So instead of banging out quotes, ask yourself, how am I helping people? Because you need to build up your skill set so that you can provide value to people, not just a price. Now, doesn't that just tie into everything we talk about? But it doesn't matter what sector you're in or what industry, it's all the same. Value over price. But here's the kicker. And this is what people don't want to accept. And this is why a lot of people don't do this. But this is also why a lot of people don't win. All right? You may not get paid for up to even 70% of the work that you do here. 70%, I'm serious, right? 70% of the work that you do will never result in a contract. It will never result in money or work. But offering that amount of time, that effort, that energy for free is worth it, right? Because that 30% that you win will be massive. That's the reality. So another example on this from my dad, he's got a few of these. He's pretty damn good at this stuff. You know, he was working with Woolworths. And they had a 2.5 megawatts of solar. They couldn't get it connected, right? So that's a massive, massive amount of energy savings, you know, if it's working, but it was just sitting there and they couldn't use it because it couldn't be connected. Now, they'd spent millions, like quite a few millions on the installation, but the connection was a problem. So they had, you know, these are massive companies. They had all these engineers, all these people working really hard to solve the problem, but they didn't understand the energy energy requirements. So they'd had a crack, they'd uh, actually ordered a whole bunch of switch gear from overseas, but when it arrived, the reality was half of it wasn't even needed. So they'd overspent where they hadn't had to, um, and they were still missing certain elements. So they're well over budget, they have no connection point here, so it's still not being utilized. And this is a green company who can't even turn on their solar panels, so to speak. It's a problem. So dad went in, he analyzed what was going on and then explained very clearly, you know, it was in true war and peachy fashion. It was a big war and peace email, but he just outlined exactly where they were going wrong. He diagnosed the problem to a T, but he did it in a way where he was able to explain and demonstrate that he understood the situation. So he laid out their options, you know, option one, do nothing, right? Keep going down the same path, but here's the process, here's the outcomes. Terrible option. No one wants to pick option one, right? Next option is reduce the megawatts. But that wasn't an option either because they'd already spent so much money getting to this point, right? They spent a fortune on this thing. So option three was then spend more money with him to solve the issue and even bring the megawatts up to, I think it was like five or something. So expand that. Um, But after sending that email, within four minutes, he'd received an email back saying, happy to proceed, you know, please proceed. And I had a phone call saying, thank you so much. (laughs) Like, thank you, thank you, thank you, right? Because they couldn't see the solution. Because they're not him. And and it's a long-winded story, but that, that's the point I'm trying to make here. And he was dealing with middle managers, right? But with millions of dollars on the line, you know, you could lose your job over that sort of stuff. Like that's a that's a if you're a middle manager, that's a big problem. Because they're willing to go, who why is this happening? Whose fault is it? Yeah. So when dad went in, again, he was saying to this person, I understand the position that you're in. And then what he did was armed that person with all the necessary information to be able to take that back up the chain of command and go, here's the situation we're in. Here are our options. Here's how I recommend we solve it. I have a solution. 
I have a solution because of Warren. Yeah. Very important. So he made them look good, right? And potentially even save some jobs given the circumstances. So, well, and again, just it just happened to be that that was, you know, option three in the nodding the knight in shining armor. So that's an extreme example of how to make someone look good and, and look out for their interests. But that's why he won that $4 million job. And he was the only person bidding. Mm. <laughs> he was the only horse yep. in the race. Yep. $4, million, $4 million project. Mm. That's just one. That's yep. one example with a major builder, right? So rarely was he ever the cheapest because he, just, he, he wasn't just out there slapping a price together. That was not the strategy, right? He focused on value. And there's a big difference in just pricing a job and saying everything outside of this is not my responsibility. It doesn't affect me, right? There's a huge difference between that and thinking outside of the box, planting seeds of doubt, getting people to think about a job from your perspective, see it through your lens because you're the expert that actually understands what's going on. And you're zeroing and you're focused on one component of work. The people you're dealing with are trying to manage the entire build. It's chaos, right? And they've got little support. So, you know, solving real issues and concerns and providing real value to help someone else win because that work will come back tenfold to you at some point in the future. So if you're just banging out quote after quote and you have little success and and, and what you're doing isn't working, the simple answer, what do you need to do? Do something different. (laughs) Honestly, do something different. So you might be listening to what I'm saying here and you go, oh, you know, it's still things bullshit. I don't get it. It doesn't make sense to me. I don't, you know, nah, it, it won't work for the, my specific circumstances. But the bare minimum, if what you're doing isn't working, you need to try something different. And I'm telling you, banging out quotes, quote after quote after quote, bidding machine, it's ridiculous. It doesn't have to be that way. And again, we've converted many clients from that perspective across lots of different types of industries, including builders, to the other side where the grass is greener, you know? <laughs> the grass is greener and the hair is less gray. Yeah. Um, so again, get to know the other people on the other side of the tender, understand their weaknesses and risk points, work to provide real value, make them look good and make them win. Help them win. Yeah. That's my take. Troy, what do you think? Great answer. And I think that there's, there's a lot of layers to that, a lot to unpack, but I think just I've just got a few points um, that are, really just expanding on what you're talking about there. I guess a good mindset to have is obviously you, you label it as, you know, don't be selfish. Mm. Focus on the build, focus on your client. And with that, this is something we always talk about is what you're doing there is you're positioning yourself as more than just an electrical contractor. You're positioning yourself as more than just a plumbing contractor or, you know, whatever trade you are. You're positioning yourself as the trusted advisor. An ally. An ally. And I think that's, that's the key is the moment you can position yourself in that way, you're now no longer yet yeah, just a, a contractor. You're someone that they come to to seek guidance. And haven't we seen that before in, in his stories? Oh, in a lot of these cases, when he builds that relationship with them, it's no longer, hey, we've got a tender list. Do you want to be a part of this tender list? It's, no, we need to go to Warren. Mm. Warren's the solution man. And I think that, you know, that's, a, that's a testimony to, to his, his own personal success with, with the, and in the business side of things is he has become an expert at positioning himself as the trusted advisor. Yeah. And, uh, and alongside that is you're positioning yourself as the trusted advisor by positioning yourself as the expert. Yeah. Because it's one of those things where people don't know what they don't know. You, if you're, you truly are the expert and you truly know what should be going on here and you have that knowledge that they don't have, bring that to them to better their situation selflessly. You know, like you said, 70% of the time, it might not work. Because that, and that's going to be the game. But that 30% when it does, and you build that relationship, and you become the trusted advisor. Well, the, the 30% only works because of the 70%. Exactly. And I, I see it a lot of times too, it's, it's pro comms, right? A lot of people do certain things that help their clients, but they never tell them. Mm. Like little things, little, little things where you know, certain variations, but they don't charge them for it. Or they just, oh, I'll just fix that or I'll look out for this. Or there's an issue with solving another trade they're working to help with a resolve or they help with scheduling. And like any delay on a big build, major build, if you're blocking the access areas, it's costing money. Yeah. It's costing money. And if you are doing these things already, it's like anything we talk about in marketing. It doesn't matter if you're doing it. If you're doing it, it doesn't matter if no one knows about it. Mm. Communicate how you are helping these people yeah. and what's the relationship change. Yeah. Because it, and because at the end of the day, if, if you're not providing any more value, if you just look like 
every other contractor. No, not look like. If you are, yeah, if you, you are. are like, if you're doing what everybody, if you were just banging together a price like every single other person, why the hell would you win more jobs than anybody else? Or why would you be able to get away with greater price and flexibility? Of course, you're in a, a race to the bottom. Because all the, all the builders are looking for is, well, they're all the same. They all look the same. They all are the same. I'll go with the cheapest. Instead of going in their building relationship and coming and going, hey, there's a really big problem that I don't know if you've, you've, you've flagged yet. Mm. Can I come into the office and run you through it? Yeah. Hey, have you considered this? Yeah. What about this? Oh, I don't know. I wasn't sure if you, you've noticed. This might happen if we do it this way. Yeah. Ooh, that's interesting. I didn't think about that. Yeah, well, hey, I bet I'll get this sorted. Yeah. Like, be different. Yeah. Help them. And again, it comes back to the easiest way to look at this is do not be selfish. Yeah. It is bigger than you. It is about the project success. Yeah. Make them look good, help them solve real problems and progress their project. Yeah. That's the number one goal. Yeah, 100%. And I think, I think with that as well is, you know, you can make it easier for yourself. And one of the simplest things you can do with that, you know, in combination with everything we just said there, is to look for, for opportunities and work with higher barrier to entry. Yeah, you want to shorten the tender list. Yeah. Just right from that, obviously, you know, we're talking about this. You can do this in, in scenarios where there are big tender lists. Uh, by building better the, relationships. Yeah, with, by building better relationships. Because the best tender list is the ones you get invited. Exactly. To but in, in this process is why make it harder for yourself? Go to that, you know, bar- the high barrier entry work where there might be only four guys on the list. Mm. It's easier to stand out and there's more complexity and more problems that, and, and bigger solutions so available. So bigger problems. Exactly. So, and I think that's that's a really important point to make. But I think overall... Again, if you're if you're positioning yourself as the trusted advisor, as the expert, you're work, working selflessly to selflessly to you know help better their situation. That will come around. Yeah, and just be. This is the thing too. Be prepared to do a lot of stuff and not have any tangible um, re- reward for it. Yeah. Like you're going to do a lot of things that you won't get compensated for, exactly. but that's the game. Because again, you know, I've witnessed my dad do this, you know, go from nothing yeah. to the go-to advisor within five years of the entire state. Like yeah. it's just, there's, the phone won't stop ringing. Like he's turned down more work yeah. than, than he could take on. It's just, it's yeah. insane. And that was all he did. He calls it the strategy of preeminence. Yeah. Position yourself as the advisor. So that's the advice there. You know, any, any more words on that one or? I think one final thing, this probably touches more so into the, the sales side of everything there is... To position yourself as the trusted advisor, it's so important that you're selling the stories, you're selling the experiences, what you've seen, where you've seen it go wrong and people go down the path that they're looking at going down, where they've got a plan in place and they go, no, no, this is how we think we should do it. Oh, I'm a bit I'm a bit concerned about how you're looking to approach that project because you know, back on you know, one, two, three Smith Street, this is what happened when we when we looked at it like that. That's why I had to come in and we proposed the solution to be like this and we solved it this way. All of a sudden, this goes back to almost the, what you're saying before. You're asking them questions they're not thinking about. Mm. Is because they don't know what they don't know, and now you've got them, you know, sitting back, thinking about something a little bit differently yeah. from a different perspective because they got the blinkers on because they don't understand. They don't know. So again, that's how you're going to be able to position yourself as that trusted strategic advisor that they're going to come to, and you're not you're not in the same boat as every other contractor. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, you know, that's all we have time for today. So again, I want to thank everyone that sent in questions we really appreciate it it's fun answering these questions we enjoy it um, if you have a question that you like answered um, or you, you know you, you want to hear our two cents on at least you know reach out on literally any one of our social media accounts if you head to www.tradebusinessaccountants.com.au on the top left the little banner you'll be able to see all our socials if you haven't already subscribe to the podcast to be notified when more episodes come out uh, we're also going to chuck this on youtube so um, you can look at our ugly mugs, but uh, subscribe to Trade Business Accountants on YouTube if you want to be notified when those episodes go live as well. For those who don't know, we run the accounting firm, Trade Business Accountants. Uh, you know, most firms, they just want to file your tax returns at the end of the year. That's not us, right? We do all the usual stuff really well. So that's bookkeeping, tax, structures and whatnot. But what makes us different is that we work proactively with all our clients and we coach and we advise them to help them earn significantly more money now rather than just meeting come into financial year to simply outline how they went when it's already too late to do anything about it. That's our big difference. So if that resonates with you, head to www.tradebusinessaccounts.com.au and book in a call. We'd love to chat. Troy, have you got any final words? I think it's it's a, it's an enjoyable uh, process, you know, jumping on this podcast and answering these questions. With our new mics. <laughs> Hopefully we weren't talking too close to them, to be honest. <laughs>
one. We'll see how it goes. But uh, no, it's great. Um, and obviously, exciting podcast for, for next week with uh, Jim from, from Jim's group. So I'm excited to see what the outcome of that one is. That's a good one. Yeah, so, I'm excited for that. But uh, yeah, if you've got any more questions, shoot them through to us. You know, all our social media platforms are always there. And uh, or any question, you know, just questions in general. If you don't want us to uh, talk about it on podcasts, you would just want a direct answer, just mention it and we're happy to do that as well. Yeah, 100%. Here to help. Um, all right, well, another episode down. I want to thank everyone for listening. Stay tuned for the next episode. But until then, this is Bailey and Troy signing off. We'll catch you on the next one. Mm-hmm.